So the recording begins. I now turn the event over to Professor Erez Manella, Acting Director of the Weatherhead Center. Erez, you're on. Thanks very much, Ted. Well, uh, welcome everyone to the Weatherhead Forum. I'm Erez Manella, Professor of History and the Acting Director of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs here at Harvard University. And um, it's my great pleasure to introduce this uh, forum. The Weatherhead Forum is our platform to address pressing topics of the day and the path-breaking research being done in those areas here at Harvard and beyond. Uh, these special sessions are open to the public. So thank you for joining us virtually this year for this endeavor. Um, <clears throat> the topic of our forum today is the war in Ukraine. How does it end? And we have uh, four uh, preeminent experts in, um, uh, on this topic to speak to, to us today. Um, I'll introduce them in a minute. Each, uh, each speaker, once I introduce them, uh, will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our four speakers in the order that they will speak. The first speaker is Timothy Colton. He is the Morris and Anna Feldberg Professor of Government and Russian mm -hmm. Studies at Harvard University. And he's also the chair of the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies, uh, which is part of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. His main research interests uh, include uh, Russian and Eurasian government and politics, and his books, his books include um, most recently, Russia, What Everyone Needs to Know, and Everyone Loses the Ukraine Crisis and the Ruinous Contest for Post-Soviet Eurasia. You can see publications that are extremely pertinent to our topic today. Our second speaker will be Tanya Kozereva. Tanya is a fellow with the Neiman Foundation this year at Harvard. She is an investigative reporter based in Kyiv. She has worked for many international news organizations focusing on geopolitics and high-level corruption. As Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine began, she covered the war for The Telegraph, Sky News, The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and The New York Times. Our third speaker will be Serhii Plochi. He is the Mikhail Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History in the Department of History at Harvard and the Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute, also at Harvard. He is the author of numerous books, including um, The Russo-Ukrainian War, The Return of History, which is forthcoming, I understand, next month. Uh, the Frontline, the Frontline Essays on Ukraine's Past and Present, which was pub published, um, I think, in 2021, and The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine. Our final speaker will be Konrad Zielinski, who is a visiting fellow from Poland with the Weatherhead Scholars Program, which is also part of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. So with this, I will yield the floor to our, uh, our first speaker, mm -hmm. Professor Colton. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I suffer from pre-pollen these days, so I'm a little gruff, <clears throat> and uh, I may have to sneeze at some point. Uh, I'll keep that to a minimum. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, Aris referred to, what was it, press, pressing issues. They don't get more pressing or explosive, really, than this one. And even though some of these discussions get a little repetitive, I think it's worth doing them as often as possible, just because of the importance of the issue. Um, I wrote a short paper with my, my co-author, Sam Sharp of the RAND Corporation on this last, uh, I think we drafted it in September and presented it in October. And then I gave another talk on the same subject not so long ago. In fact, I think I'm missing one. And reflecting back on this uh, several months, six, oh, half year really, uh, of cogitating over, over all of this, I. I will admit that I don't feel that I have any greater basis for confidently forecasting what's going to happen now than we did in September when we were very ginger about it because the war was only half year old. It's now, we're well into the second year and I don't think it's um, 
possible to do much more than consider some probabilities. And in, in, in our case, Sam and I, we were more concerned with lay, laying out scenarios than with estimating probabilities. Now, that's a little bit cowardly, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, and I'll venture uh, just a tiny bit into the probabilities. Now, there is a scholarship on this general topic of how wars end, but it is interesting to note at the outset that that scholarship is quite a bit underdeveloped compared to uh, the work that political scientists and historians and others have done on war origination. So just a quote from uh, somebody who observed this point, we know relatively little about how wars end in contrast to the mountain ranges of ideas and scholarship we have about how wars start. So uh, we, we look at this, we peer at this problem at a little bit of a disadvantage. Although I will also say that it's not so easy to explain uh, on any scientific basis why this uh, wretched war started in the first place. So in this case, war termination is very, very hard to forecast. And war origination, you know, remains behind many veils, just exactly why the Russians decided to do this, when they decided, uh, who decided, and all the rest of it. Uh, eventually, the archives will, will uh, reveal the secrets, but for the moment, uh, we're, we're peering through a lot of veils. Um, so uh, let, let me just uh, present the bare skeleton of what we've been talking about since last fall. Uh, and uh, so I have a typology. Sarah has heard this before. Uh, and it's a fairly industry standard with a little bit of refinement. So these are ideal types, I emphasize, uh, right? So they're, they're not detailed scenarios. They're somewhat artificial and their main, uh, their main function is to help us focus uh, and maybe arrive at conclusions that will not conform to any of the ideal types. But the ideal types are simply as follows. There are four of them. Total victory by one side or the other. So the Ukrainians win or the Russians win, period. Tochka, as they say in Russian. Uh, secondly, a negotiated settlement in which neither side wins, but they sit down at the negotiating table and agree to settle their differences uh, with, without further conflict. Thirdly, a protracted conflict in which uh, there is not total victory by either side, nor is there a negotiated settlement, but the war just kind of drags on. Uh, and, and wars can drag on for a very long time, unfortunately. And then fourth, armistice, uh, which is a fairly precise category, which is sometimes um, discussed with, without a lot of uh, uh, precision. But I, uh, we, we think it's a, a, a pretty specific thing that maybe we should understand a little better than we do. Okay, so just to, to say a few words about each of these, so total victory is, you know, a priori. This is what any, what any belligerent would most want, right? Uh, and total victory means defeating your adversary's forces in the field. But it also, it goes well beyond that. It, it also uh, in, entails imposing a settlement, not through negotiation, but through uh, com uh, a, a compelled settlement. Uh, and history gives us, of course, many, many examples of total victory, unconditional surrender of uh, Germany and Japan in 1945 being, uh, being the obvious ones, but hardly the, the only ones. Um, and uh, it, it typically, total victory, if it's going to really be um, something to rely on, uh, will normally involve also ch a change of government or of regime in the defeated country. So not only do you defeat the, your opponent's soldiers, but you take your, the leaders of your adversary out of the game completely. And that also happened, of course, in 1945. Uh, is this a likely outcome from this war, total victory by one side or the other? This is, of course, debatable. We, we couldn't possibly know with confidence. What we do know from uh, experience, I think, is that um, a lot of this is going to hinge on the minutiae of the battles that are fought in, in the coming months. Um, uh, and the, these may extend into future years. It's, that, that is very hard to say. Um, I would say myself, I think that total victory by either side is unlikely, but it is not impossible. Um, it's very unlikely that, the, I'd say very unlikely that Russia will manage to do this. It's not though out of the question by any means that the Ukrainians, uh, now that they're as well armed and of course highly motivated as they are, would achieve um, a less than total victory, but nonetheless a moral victory. I don't think they're likely, uh, well, we know they're not able to impose regime change on Russia, but there could conceivably be re regime change that happens because of Russian defeat. 
Um, but the likelihood of this happening on either side, I think, is still relatively low. But, you know, we should uh, write this sort of thing down in pencil because we shall see. Uh, and there is, uh, as we all are aware, there's going to be a Ukrainian counteroffensive in the coming months, and that's going to be watched very, very uh, closely. Um, okay, quickly, negotiated settlement for the moment, uh, very, very unlikely. I mean, the gap between uh, the two sides or the multiple sides by now is so immense that it's very hard to see uh, how uh, it could be bridged. And there's really no one out there uh, for the moment in a in a position to act as a disinterested uh, arbiter. Although it's this is a role that conceivably China uh, you know will aspire to eventually, but for the moment that also seems quite unreal. Um, now, um, public opinion polls do show that um, there is interest, especially in Russia, in in negotiation as a form uh, and in in talking with the Ukrainians and. You should be aware, most of you probably are, that there were negotiations during the first six weeks of the war, roughly. Uh, there actually were pretty serious negotiations in, in, in Turkey between a Russian and a Ukrainian delegation, which resulted in a draft agreement, which uh, it turns out was not implemented, but it was rather interesting business. I can say more about it later if you want. Um, and uh, so it's not entirely inconceivable that there could be a return to this eventually, but not, I think, until matters have moved uh, on the battlefield to such an extent uh, that the, the two sides see it as, you know, in their interest. War weariness may eventually uh, set in. Um, I've been reading a, a, a very long study of Henry Kissinger uh, and the Middle East peace uh, from the 1970s, and, and uh, it's really interesting to hear uh, his uh, private conversations and memos about this at the time, uh, believing that a, a, a permanent peace between the Arabs and Israelis would take probably decades to work out, uh, and that a, an incremental strategy would be the best, best way to approach it. That may turn out to be the case here, but for the moment, uh, no negotiated settlement, and I, I would say, you know, essentially no negotiations until things have moved further on the, on the battlefield. The third and very messy, uh, the three ideal types is uh, protracted conflict. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are some quantitative studies of how long wars last. Um, and it, it's, it's certainly, I'd say, <clears throat> more likely than not that this uh, is going to end up the, as the category in which the, the Russian-Ukrainian war uh, ends up as of the end of this year, at least. It's already going to be a rather long war. So one study shows that that half of all interstate wars since 1945 have ended within one year. Um, and uh, of course, this war is, is kind of just getting started well, well into a second year. We have Iran, Iraq as, you know, uh, maybe a bookend, uh, uh, the better part of 10 years, eight years in the field. Uh, this seems unlikely uh, for this war, given the intensity at which it's being fought, but I don't think we can say that it's uh, out of the question. Um, so this becomes a little bit of a, of, a, of a default category. If you can't, if no one achieves total victory, if there's no possibility of negotiated settlement, then protracted conflict uh, is um, uh, one of the two likely outcomes and probably uh, the, the most uh, likely. And I can explain a little bit more why I think that's the case. Um, a protracted conflict can take many forms. It can involve uh, long-range fire attacks that uh, happen irregularly, temporary ceasefires, territory changing hands. Uh, uh, it, it, can, it can look, uh, take a lot of different shapes, um, and we shall see how whether that's feasible in this case. And finally, fourthly, armistice. So uh, an armistice is um, a formal agreement. Uh, it's not just a cessation of fighting, uh, but an actual agreement uh, to ceasefire without settling the broader substantive differences between uh, the warring parties. It ends or at least suspends the war in question, but does, it does not make peace. It's not to be confused with a mere truce or anything like that. It's, it's, it's something rather more serious. Um, there is international uh, legislation and law on armistices, uh, which is pretty interesting stuff. Um, and is, is this a possibility for this war? Sure, and it would be less injurious uh, to uh, human life uh, and uh, the material well-being of these two countries and others than a protracted conflict. 
uh, but it, for the moment, seems also quite uh, remote, a remote possibility. Uh, the war weariness uh, that would uh, help bring it about, the understanding on both sides that total victory is impossible, uh, an understanding that there's no practical way to achieve a negotiated settlement. These are going to arrive, if at all, or only in the course of time in this, uh, in this war. Uh, and I would say, though, that as compared with a practice um, uh, conflict, it's more desirable. Uh, I mean, from the point of view of most of us, a negotiated settlement would be the best way out, but that seems uh, for the moment to be pie in the sky. So I could say a lot more about the reasoning behind uh, the ideal types and um, and what I think about them, but I think I've spoken long enough. Uh, the, the total victory scenario is quite interesting, and there are questions here about how total does total have to be, uh, but we can get to that in the discussion. And I've, oh, I'm sorry, one final point, escalation. Didn't get into that because it's not really about war termination, but I think it should be on our agenda today because there are certain things underway that point in the direction of uh, a rather alarming uh, direction in terms of escalation from the Russian side. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Next, we'll have uh, Tanya. I would like to focus mostly on the impact that war has uh, on Ukrainian journalism, as I am uh, the representative of the profession uh, here at Harvard. So uh, I can tell on behalf of my, can talk on behalf of my colleagues uh, from uh, Ukraine. Um, so just to uh, tell you, before coming here, um, before coming to US uh, and being a Neiman Fellow, um, I, my work was mostly focusing on reporting the Russian atrocities in Ukraine, interviewing live witnesses of war crimes all over Ukraine, kids who lost their limbs, parents whose children are missing or stuck under the rebels, families who, whose loved ones were kidnapped in Ukrainian cities and villages under the Russian occupations, and those who buried relatives in the backyards of their family house. I went to extremely dangerous places near the front line like Piski, Bakhmut, Slovyansk, and Lysychansk. I believed it was my duty to take this risk. I think it's a duty of journalism to tell the truth no matter what. Previously, my work focused mostly on high-level corruption worldwide, by, but war changed my agenda. For now, the most important story for me and most of Ukrainian journalists is Russian aggression in my own country. Ukrainian journalists are facing an incredibly challenging reality as they witness atrocities committed by Russia while also taking care of their families and loved ones. They are working under the condition of constant shortages of electricity, internet, and uh, also while being exposed to everyday life-threatening situations. Tragically, 67 journalists have been killed during the war in Ukraine, including the Neiman fellow Brent Renault and my dear friend, Ukrainian photojournalist Max Levin. Their loss is painful reminder of the importance of freedom of press and sacrifices journalists take to report on conflicts and crises all over the world. Russian invasion has already impacted journalism in Ukraine. Some of the best journalists have already died. Some joined the Ukrainian army. The others are jung jung jungling facts and creating the space for propaganda. Some Ukrainian independent media have lost their financial support and are struggling to survive. In the long term, I think Ukrainian journalists, journalism can lose everything it gained during the last eight years. And just to map the losses Ukraine might face in the near future, uh, I need to remind you what it gained over the last few years. Shortly after 2014 revolution, uh, big oligarch-owned media holdings lost their influence. Ukrainian media switched to Ukrainian language. The level of media literacy started growing. Russian TV channels and social media like Vkontakte was were banned. All these factors created the environment for the growth of Ukrainian independent news outlets and influential investigative teams. The current reality for journalists, sadly, is that they face significant challenges and not only with reporting from constantly shelled areas, but also um, with burnout and mental health. 
covering the on ongoing Russian invasion and reporting the war crimes in uh, your own country can be emotionally draining. So many Ukrainian journalists have been forced to quit their jobs as a result. According to the Institute of Mass Information, more than 200 regional media outlets went bankrupt or were forced to shut down because of the invasion. The work process during the war is incredibly difficult to the constant blackouts, cyber attack, displacement of the media teams uh, and drafted male workers. The state become a big media player as the TV marathon started, which united several TV channels and opened the um, window for the censorship. On top of that, we can see that um, that the audience, uh, Ukrainian readers are migrating. They're uh, mostly uh, catching on the news in the Telegram, which is uh, Russian social media. And I have to tell you that uh, every second user in Ukraine or se every second Ukrainian are getting the news from the Telegram and it's faster channel of communication. So you can find the news faster there because uh, it's like a direct uh, channels, but also um, this kind of opens the uh, doors for um, disinformation because most of the news, they're not verified. Most of the information that are spread it all over Telegram uh, I should tell that it's mostly misinformation. On the bright side, um, we can see that big international media opened the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian bureaus in Ukraine, uh, like New York Times, Washington Post, and NPR. And uh, 2022 was the year of uh, Ukrainian English language journalism. Um, most of the media that used to have only Ukrainian and Russian version or only Ukrainian version now, you can find them uh, in English. It's Ukrainska Pravda, uh, and Be and no Novaya Vremya, and Kiev Independent. This is uh, like three uh, top Ukrainian uh, English version uh, news outlet that you might follow already, or uh, I encourage you to follow. Uh, also, uh, one of the tendency uh, we can see now that um, um, investigative teams in Ukraine, they kind of slowly switched from um, investigating uh, war crimes to looking into the corruption stories in Ukraine. Uh, and they are uh, still uh, shedding light on uh, issues that uh, of national importance. And, and just to finish uh, my short um, uh, introduction, uh, I want to say that, uh, of course, um, the media landscape is evolves uh, and it's changing, but um, um, Ukrainian journalists and Ukrainian media continue to prioritize truthful and ethical reporting. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, Sefi, the next. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Eris. Uh, my uh, co-panelists talked about the situation on the ground today in Ukraine and also the possible outcome of the war and uh, how it would what sort of a settlement there can be in a relatively short period of time, hopefully within months or, or, or year. Um, I am a historian, so what I will try to do, I will try to deal with the question of how does the war end, put in developments on the ground in the historical perspective. And uh, one thing that is uh, quite clear for me is that uh, the war uh, that we uh, witness today uh, is the war of the imperial succession of the of the um, Soviet succession, but even even deeper than that, we really witness uh, one of the chapters, hopefully final chapters, of the story of the disintegration of the Russian Empire. Uh, that started uh, back in 1914 with the start of World War I and then the revolution of 1917. 
the Russian Empire was stitched together by the Bolsheviks uh, back in the early 1920s, and uh, the Soviet Union fell apart uh, in 1991. We uh, all hoped on, on different levels, put in different uh, understanding into those terms, but we all hoped for the end of history as, as at least the, the history of the imperial, uh, imperial uh, conquests or existence, imperial existence in uh, Eastern and Central uh, part of Europe, Eurasia as well. It didn't happen, and uh, it turns out today that the war, the big war in particular, was just postponed. Uh, in 1991, the military action started already in Chechnya. Uh, 2008, there was Georgia, and uh, 2014 and 2022, uh, Russian aggression against, against Ukraine. Um, looking at this war in that particular historical frame, uh, it's uh, quite easy to foresee really the possible outcome of the war long term. Uh, we know that empires fall. We know that the uh, nation states or the, the, the states that try to become nation states emerge on the ruins of those empires. And uh, what we witnessed in the last year, year and a half, certainly suggests that we are dealing here with a more or less um, usual pattern in terms of the historical development. Um, Ukraine didn't collapse, Ukraine survived, and it's uh, quite, uh, um, one, can, one can certainly assume with a major degree of probability that Ukraine as an independent state will continue. So that is that is the the reality on the ground today, and most likely this is this is the situation that will continue into the future. The war, uh, the way how it was framed, uh, in particular by Vladimir Putin, uh, was uh, imperial war. His his rhetoric and and logic, uh, historical logic, was going back to the imperial narratives that were created back in the 19th century about Russians and Ukrainians being one and the same people. But the same rhetoric suggested that what is at stake there, at least for the, for the aggressor, was not just a continuation of the imperial story and some uh, post-imperial form of the control over the post-Soviet space. At issue was the question also of the uh, identity, Russian identity in particular, and Ukrainian identity as well. What we see already today is that the war started under the banner that Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people, and that Ukrainians were just corrupt Russians who had to be liberated from the um, oppression of the Nazis and, and uh, uh, I guess, President Zelensky. Um, that war produced uh, opposite result that is clear today, and there are, there are good reasons to believe that it will continue. It certainly solidified the Ukrainian national identity. Uh, it certainly um, increased the, the level of the um, really mobilization of that identity around uh, issues like language, culture, history. And uh, it's difficult for me to imagine a situation in which tens of thousands of the body bags in which um, in, in tens of thousands of uh, wounded in, in this war uh, would not undermine the uh, thinking of the Russian elites, but also uh, Russian thinking in general uh, about, about the uh, level of unity and disunity between Russians and Ukrainians. And in, to summarize that, the war clearly draws a much clearer boundary than they existed ever before at least in the last uh, decades and centuries, uh, between Russian and Ukrainian identity and Russian and Ukrainian states. We also found ourselves uh, uh, looking at things historically in a situation that very much reminds us about the Cold War and Cold War divisions in Europe and Cold War divisions in the world in general. Uh, war produced a phenomenon that uh, can be probably um, uh, characterized as return of the West. 
we see the level of transatlantic unity and solidarity uh, that we didn't see since the end of the Cold War back in 1989, 1990, and 1991. So the, the uh, American leadership in the world is uh, being reinstated again after, after a long period of um, sometimes just absence, absence of the United States as a major player in, in European affairs. And um, we see a tendency toward the disappearance of the gray zones, security gray zones in uh, Europe. The situation that would remind us about certainly um, Cold War, if not Iron Curtain as a whole. So until the start of this war, uh, there were certainly uh, uh, unclarity in, in the world capitals about uh, the future of Ukraine, uh, about the future of Moldova, the questions about Georgia are still there. Uh, and there were certainly questions asked about Belarus, especially during the, um, um, the, 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 the public, public protests in, 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 that, uh, in that country uh, after, after stolen elections, stolen by uh, President Lukashenko. Um, the uh, fact that uh, Ukraine is now became the member, the, the um, candidate member of the European Union, uh, looking at what is happening certainly in Moldova, um, given the level of integration, not formal integration, but certainly informal integration of Ukraine into different NATO structures from the sharing of intelligence information, to the uh, ability of the Ukrainians now, they're learning how to fight with the NATO um, uh, equipment and, and weaponry and so on and so forth, suggests that Ukraine not only survived, but it's actually continues on its path to the integration into the uh, Western and transatlantic structures. And again, that uh, disappearance of these gray zones reminds us about the Cold War. Uh, and uh, given the how long the Cold War lasted, certainly one of the suggestions is that probably that that would continue. And uh, uh, last point that I want to make it's about the impact of this current war on the uh, international order and on the transformation of the international order in particular. <clears throat> we see that um, one thing that already happened it's uh, um, implosion of Russia as a major military power, uh, certainly as an economic power in the region and, and, and beyond. And uh, we see reformatting of the Russian-Chinese relations with a lot of observers uh, reminding us about the situation back in the uh, late 1940s, 1950s. Um, but with the um, China-Soviet alliance now presented in a different way and different form with China being really in the driving seat and Russia becoming a junior a partner. Uh, that certainly already has and will have in the future a major impact on the, on the way how the uh, US relations with China are being imagined, uh, are being shaped, and as a result on, on, the new, on the new disposition of forces on the global arena. In, in, in general. So returning to the, to the question of how does uh, uh, the war end, um, from my perspective, um, it, it, uh, the chances are extremely high that it will end with the victory of Ukraine. The, the question is what that victory would mean, but as a minimum, it would mean a continuation of um, Ukraine as an independent state integration into European and transatlantic structures and significant weakening of Russia. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sahi. Uh, Conrad, you're next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aris, for uh, having me. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, speak last, always a privilege that uh, I've been used to uh, with a last name that starts with a Z. Um, but uh, seriously, I want to use the remaining time that uh, we have to uh, give you a little bit of the Polish perspective. And through that, through explaining this context, maybe try to uh, answer this 
difficult, of course, question how the war ends. Uh, but uh, the Polish perspective on the war in Ukraine um, uh, is the one that uh, actually means what, what many people in Poland uh, see and, uh, and how they feel about the war. And when I mean people living in Poland, I also mean um, many, many uh, Ukrainians. And I myself uh, live in uh, Poland, and uh, it really is incredible to uh, witness firsthand uh, this um, uh, amazing uh, phenomenon, this outpouring of solidarity with Ukrainians uh, across Poland. And um, of course, uh, many people are hopeful, uh, but uh, I want to explain, uh, give you a wider uh, context of, of wider implications of what this war uh, means for the whole region. And, uh, and this view from Warsaw, if you will, uh, I think is an important one because um, uh, the war is happening just across our uh, border. Uh, millions of Ukrainians made Poland their home. And uh, given that uh, Poland uh, has become, uh, in the recent months, uh, NATO center of gravity uh, for uh, political, military, and uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, but essentially, um, one thing to uh, understand is that uh, the Polish perspective uh, has always been shaped by our shared experiences with Ukrainians, but also with uh, peoples uh, in the region. Uh, and that is because we uh, simply, we were um, in Ukraine's shoes before. Even historically speaking, uh, Nazi Germany and uh, Soviet Russia committed unspeakable atrocities in Poland during World War II and, and after the war as well. Uh, but not only in Poland, um, this is a shared experience for the whole uh, region for, for many uh, nations that currently border Russia. And uh, that is why many of these uh, uh, countries adopted a very realist approach to, uh, to Russia, because we have always known uh, firsthand what the real dangers of uh, Russian imperialism are. Uh, of course, uh, before the war, not everyone in Europe shared our perspective. Uh, some states uh, had an idealized view uh, of Russia. But um, time um, has proven that we were right on Russia and uh, that the policy of uh, making deals with, uh, with Russia was a big mistake. Uh, and it, in fact, emboldened Russia to, uh, to start this war. And um, in Poland, there's a feeling, um, and I'm not afraid to use some big words here, uh, that uh, this is a defining moment for all of Europe, uh, and actually not only Europe, because uh, this war does have uh, global implications. Uh, imagine for a moment Russia were to win this war. Imagine what it would mean for millions of uh, Ukrainians uh, if their national identity is unacceptable for Russia. Uh, imagine what string of consequences it would unleash for uh, other countries in Eastern Europe. Because uh, Putin, of course, wouldn't certainly stop at Ukraine. Uh, and then further, what it would mean for countries of Central Europe, such as Poland, and uh, for the stability of uh, the European Union and uh, of NATO. Uh, but finally, what it would mean also for the United States in the world. Um, and uh, the whole world is, is watching um, how we react to uh, Russia's atrocities, how we react to uh, Russia's blatant disregard for uh, international law, how we react to uh, the pushing of a sovereign country's borders. Because if Russia were to succeed, uh, its methods would be legitimized. They would be legitimized not only in the eyes of its authorities and in the eyes of its uh, large population, but worst of all, they would be uh, legitimized in the eyes of other dictators. And in Poland, 
we see that very clearly. Uh, and that is why we're very committed to uh, helping Ukraine uh, in its defense, but also to uh, uh, raising our own uh, defense spending to uh, 4% GDP. Uh, in, in Warsaw, there is a feeling that this is a means of ensuring uh, peace through deterrence. And uh, I want to give you uh, a little bit of data that doesn't um, often appear in the media. Uh, so what does it look like in uh, real numbers? So just to put things in perspective, Poland is a country uh, with a population of roughly 40 million people. In a matter of months, uh, the Polish border was crossed by 10 million refugees. Some of them uh, re-emigrated to other countries. Uh, some of them returned to Ukraine. Uh, but uh, almost 2 million refugees stayed in Poland and they were uh, accommodated uh, without having to build a single refugee camp. So how is that possible? Of course, uh, according to a recent poll, 77% uh, of uh, Polish people have been engaged in one way or another uh, in helping refugees. 12% uh, posted refugees in their own homes. So, uh, of course, these people uh, needed a safe refuge. They, they needed education for their uh, children. They needed um, uh, health care. They needed jobs. And they, and they found it in Poland. Um, it is also a, a financial strain in 2022 of Poland um, allocated 9 billion US dollars for humanitarian aid for uh, refugees. But of course, uh, the context uh, goes on. It, of course, the humanitarian aid is, is not the end of the story. Um, in military terms, uh, Poland uh, remains one of the top defense aid donors to uh, Ukraine alongside the uh, United Kingdom and of course the United States, which is uh, the biggest. But what uh, mattered most and uh, perhaps was instrumental in uh, keeping Ukraine alive in those initial days uh, after the war broke out when many uh, thought that Ukraine wouldn't last a week uh, is that um, uh, Poland acted immediately. Uh, sometimes tried to mobilize um, allies, uh, turning deliberations into decisions and uh, decisions into deliveries. And um, I know that uh, figures don't often make headlines, but uh, I think it is important to just acknowledge the sheer scale uh, of what's going on on the ground um, uh, in, in, in Poland and how much uh, is being done to to uh, make sure that uh, this uh, war is uh, tipped over to uh, uh, Ukraine's favor. Um, first of all, Poland has so far delivered over 300 uh, battle tanks. Um, and uh, we, of course, led this coalition of uh, countries to uh, convince uh, other allies to deliver uh, Leopard tanks. Uh, and finally, all taboos were broken um, with the delivery of the uh, Polish and Slovak um, uh, fighter jets. So um, there is a strong hope that with the fighter jets delivery and with the delivery of all the other uh, military uh, equipment from the United States, Poland, uh, uh, UK and other allies, um, this... Uh, these deliveries will turn the tide of this war uh, for Ukraine, and, and it is a strong belief that uh, it is possible. Um, um, I know that we are uh, pressed for time, so on a closing note, let me uh, just say that um, many people um, in Poland feel that uh, Ukrainians are fighting not only for their lives, uh, but also for the freedom of the whole of Europe. And I know it, uh, it sounds serious um, because it is, it is serious. And uh, they are up against someone who uh, despises their uh, national identity. Uh, so um, in order to help uh, end this war, 
the way that Ukraine would like it to end, we also um, have a duty to uh, oppose Russia, um, to oppose Russia's uh, neo-imperial ambitions. Because essentially, uh, neo-imperialism is uh, neo-colonialism. And uh, the best antidote for uh, Russian imperial ambitions uh, is um, the United States and Europe staying uh, closely united. So um, uh, how the war uh, ends, um, of course, um, in Poland, there is this strong belief that the war ends as soon as the Russian leadership realizes that um, the war was a mistake and that they no longer have uh, resources to carry on the war effort. And uh, of course, we're doing everything we can to uh, help them uh, reach that conclusion sooner uh, rather than later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conrad. Um, and thank you to all of the panelists. If you could turn back on your uh, cameras and join, join us virtually in this panel, um, we can start the uh, Q&A portion of uh, the forum. Uh, and we already have a number of uh, questions lined up in the queue. Uh, I did, however, um, I don't usually do this, but I did want to um, take the chair's prerogative um, and, and um, ask the first question to the panel. Um, and that has to do with a comment that Professor Colton made. Um, a lot of the, our assumptions playing forward the, um, you know, how the war might end uh, assume that the current government's um, current leadership will stay in place in, in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but Tim, you mentioned the possibility of a regime change in Russia. And I want to see if you'd be willing, you or, and, and or other panelists would be willing to play that out just a bit more what you think the likelihood is for that, how you think that might play out and how that might impact the situation. And in, I, would, I would actually appreciate it if, if anybody wanted to talk about a similar possibility in, in, in Ukraine, or, or do we think that that is impossible that the Zelensky government is, uh, is um, uh, impregnable? Well, that's a very good question, of course, uh, <clears throat> that we all wonder about. It certainly doesn't seem imminent. Um, but, you know, revolutions are often unexpected events. That's the way it's happened in Ukraine, for example. So I don't think it can be <clears throat> excluded. But Putin has, uh, you know, coercive means at his disposal, which are uh, almost unique, I think, among modern countries. Um, and he still has majority support for continuing the war. Uh, <clears throat> we know this from public opinion polls that uh, you know, converge on this uh, on this conclusion, including ones done by several independent polling agencies. Now, um, I, I think what's one, one shift that's occurred is that um, when 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 a sizable minority of the Russian population favored negotiations early on, they they want uh, you know thirty percent roughly and considerably higher among uh, the younger generation. We're in favor of stopping the fighting and entering into negotiations, but support for that particular, you know, uh, fork in the road has actually gone down as it has sunk in uh, in public opinion that <clears throat> uh, that Russia is at risk of being defeated in the war. So initially, it was sort of the, the what powered this was the sense that the, this is, was a wrong decision, a big mistake. Uh, the costs were going to be impossible to bear, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Russia was going to become a prize state. All the rest of it. But now I think um, the, that fear of defeat has kind of taken over in certain circles. The other thing that has um, been very interesting to observe is that um, although you could argue that those who control um, armed force in Russia, the, the security services, the army itself, have um, you know looked very incompetent at most turning points since last February, the the um, officials and bureaucrats. Uh, who uh, take care of the rest of the system have actually done a pretty good job by comparative standards, in particular uh, managing economic decline. That's what it is, of course, uh, given the sanctions. So the Russian economy seems to have shrunk in 2022 by only about 
and it's now expected uh, to grow slightly this year and next year. Now, under the surface, though, given its isolation from uh, the developed world, uh, Russia, the, gap, the technical, technological gap is bound to grow. So, that, you know, in the long term, Russia is going to pay a very heavy price for this, even if it turns into a protracted conflict uh, that, that Ukraine doesn't win. But in the short term, they are managing fairly well. Um, and one sign of this is that Putin has now uh, stated that the, the presidential election scheduled for 2024 will go ahead. He's, of course, going to win it. Uh, but nonetheless, it will be a political exercise uh, with a lot of, uh, of uh, pressure on people to, to buy into the official program. So, you know, it's, I'm not saying what I wish was going to happen, uh, but I, I think if regime change comes to Russia or even a change of government, it's probably going to be too late to halt the war in this current stage, at least. So I think it's some time off. And uh, Tanya or Sergei, you so he, uh, any thoughts on Ukraine? Does Zelensky have uh, wall-to-wall support or are, are there pockets of opposition? Tanya, would you like to comment on that? I think uh, you're more qualified than I am that particular sure. question. <clears throat> of course. Um, I think Zelensky is, um, I would say, none of the other president in Ukrainian history has this uh, enormous support from the population uh, and I don't see uh, I don't see the possibility in any near future of regime change uh, just because most of the political opponents are not even like showing their interest to participate in uh, any kind of hoops or um, they're not like there, there is none even like political figures who would express their will or try hard to underestimate the legitimacy of the current president. Uh, and as you know, probably that most of the oligarchs who usually play those games with uh, um, presidents of Ukraine, they're, they kind of lost their influence and they lost their uh, media channels. Um, so. I, I don't I don't see this in the short term perspective. Um, if we are talking about um, the election that were supposed to be next year, I think due to the current war, uh, they will be canceled. So um, Zelensky and his administration and the members of parliament that were elected in 2019, uh, I think they're more, more likely will stick around um, just because of the ongoing war and um, the martial law that was uh, activated in Ukraine. Uh, I remember that before the war, um, there was a view in some quarters that uh, Zelensky, um, that there was an oligarch whose name I now can't recall that was behind uh, Zelensky supporting him. And I gather from what you're saying now, Tanya, that you think that um, he's, he's in a sense broken free from, from that dependence if, if there was ever a dependence on him. Tim? As, as, as I understand it, uh, the Ukrainian constitution says there cannot be either parliamentary or presidential elections if there's a state of emergency, right? So. Um, unless they amend the constitution, I, I, I assume the elections will not take place. I neglected to mention one thing, which I should have said in response to uh, the question, which is that another stabilizing factor in the short term from, from the Kremlin's point of view is the mass uh, exodus of uh, liberal critics uh, of the status quo. Uh, 500,000, 600,000 Russians are elsewhere, and they would have been the ones most likely to lead uh, you know, any kind of uh, resistance movement. Some of them will come back eventually uh, and uh, and uh, help to change Russia, perhaps in a good direction, but not right away. So, do you want to weigh in on this or shall we move to the uh, questions? Yes, yeah, yes. Um, on, on Russia, uh, again, speaking historically, the revolutions and regime changes uh, take place in the conditions of unsuccessful war. So the revolution of 1905 comes with the bad news coming from the Far East. Uh, the revolution of 1917 starts with the war not going well for the Russian um, empire and uh, the um, 
soldiers really joining the protesters when the rumors uh, spread that the soldiers were about to be sent to the to the front. Uh, today, the Russian Duma adopted uh, or mm, uh, a number a number of uh, changes amendments to the law on the uh, mobilization, and everyone expects that uh, mass mobilization will start almost every every hour now, or at least at least after tomorrow, when Putin is expected to sign the mm, uh, document into law. And what we know from uh, the case when the previous uh, mobilization started, the support for the war dropped and support for negotiations went up. So we will see when, if if uh, the new wave indeed comes, probably there will be also changes in the public opinion. Uh, in terms of uh, um, Ukraine, uh, to a degree that um, <clears throat> Opposition to uh, President Zelensky exists. It exists from the uh, uh, political force associated with the previous president, uh, Petro Poroshenko, and it has been taken actually uh, uh, maybe a more, uh, more radical position toward the war than takes the government. Uh, so again, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not strong opposition, but it's certainly something that works in a way that it supports the course that currently the, the administration of President Zelensky has adopted. So I agree certainly with uh, Tanya Kozareva that I don't see, don't see uh, major changes on that front happening anytime soon. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the queue. Uh, the first question from N. Zweng is, um, how does the leak of U.S. classified documents affect the likelihood of the war's outcome? I, I believe he's or, or she um, is referring to uh, the um, the most recent leak. I don't know how how closely you follow this. I certainly haven't followed it very closely. So if, if you have any thoughts on this, um, you, you please share them. But if not, we can move on. Anybody? Well, no. uh, I can uh, I, I can uh, certainly express my opinion. I, I I don't think that there will be any impact whatsoever. Uh, there are two stories there. The one is that the information was stolen, and it's a major, major certainly problem for the uh, for the U.S. security. And the, it looks like that people are trying to deal with that. Uh, and then another story is that then it was leaked and uh, leaked so certainly with the purpose of a creation creation of great creation of a distrust between, um, I assume, United States on the one hand, Ukraine on the other, and other uh, allies in the war. Uh, so far, I don't see, I don't see any, any signs that that, uh, that plan really works. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, second question here is from Jeffrey Allen. How likely is the territorial integrity of Ukraine as it existed before 2014 to be fully recovered? What are the chances that Russia would agree to give up Crimea um, and by the same token that Ukraine would agree to give up the Donbass? If both sides were to stand their ground firmly, would this not make an armistice a likelier scenario? Well, um, you know, like I said before, the, the, their positions are, uh, the stated positions of the two governments are miles apart. Uh, and um, you know the the Russians started with a certain set of, of stated war aims, and then uh, in late spring, um, this new territorial issue was was raised. So they had recognized the independence of these two uh, so-called people's republics in the Donbas, as we all know, in February. Uh, but then uh, in May, they start uh, talking about referendums and uh, and swallowing other parts of Ukraine. So we have a layered problem here. There's Crimea, which they've controlled since 2014. The Donbass republics, and then this other, you know, strip of territory. Uh, the, this, the current Ukrainian government will, you know, will never accept that. Um, and the current Russian government has backed itself into a corner where I think it's probably difficult for them to do such a thing unless they are uh, decisively defeated in the field, which is exactly what the Ukrainians are going to attempt to do in the coming months. Uh, as for Crimea, I mean, I think you do see signals from Kiev that. If they could recover everything else, that they'd be willing to 
you know, talk about Crimea rather than making it uh, its return a precondition for an end to the hostilities. But I think we're a long way away from that. Anyone else want to comment on that question? I, I would say that uh, to return Crimea is crucial for Ukraine in the strategical terms uh, because Crimea is kind of uh, the um, the key to for or the access to the Black Sea, which crucial for Ukraine as an agricultural country. Um, so I, I assume if Ukraine, I mean, it will be incredibly hard to return Crimea because it's like military um, bases uh, mostly um, uh, on, on top of the beautiful nature. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, um, yeah, but but strategically speaking, I would say that. To, to return Crimea and to cut it from the Kerch bridge would be a huge advance um, uh, in terms of um, returning the Ukrainian or, or territorial uh, integrity and returning to the borders of um, uh, 1991. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, the next question from Ivan Snook. Um, he, uh, uh, Ivan, Ivan directs it to Professor Colton, but I, I think anybody can, any of us can take it. Uh, many Western leaders have declared that the Russian state and elite have committed genocide, uh, parentheses with reference to the Holocaust. Does this not trap the West into accepting nothing less than total victory with regime change? Is, is it true? I've, I've not heard that many accusations of genocide, but I don't follow it that closely. Yeah, well, um, certainly we've known since last uh, March, April, that uh, that things happened in uh, occupied uh, parts of northeastern Ukraine that uh, look an awful lot like, like war crimes. Um, uh, genocide is, of course, a more serious uh, charge. I'm not sure I'm qualified to comment on that, but yeah, I mean, I think um, this is added to the list of obstacles. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Putin is very much aware of what happened to Milosevic, and I, I, I'm sure he wants to uh, avoid that, that fate. Um, I, I mean, I don't think that Russia is, this, the Russian state is committed to exterminating uh, Ukrainians as human beings, but they do deny their separate identity, that's a fact. So that, I suppose one could say, is a form of ethnocide or something like that which doesn't necessarily involve mass extermination, but certainly the den denial of others to live independently. I just made that term up, ethnocide, something like that. I'm just wondering, and in, in, in maybe one of the panelists knows, I, I don't recall, for example, the US, any official of the US administration using the term genocide as distinct from war crimes. Uh, and, and I know that's, to use that term would be a, a would only happen after very careful deliberation. So I'm wondering whether those of you who follow it more, more closely have heard any official of any major Western country use the specific term genocide as opposed to war and crime. Is, it, is that out there? Is that Certainly there? not in the United States, but may, maybe somewhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is certainly initiative of creating a special tribunal uh, for the mm -hmm. crime of aggression. And that uh, goes back uh, in, in legal terms to the three, three different ways of thinking about the uh, war crimes and atrocities of Nazi Germany during the Nuremberg. So the, the genocide was something that was really associated with the position of the American uh, delegation, uh, wars, uh, crimes against humanity, British and the Soviets proposed crime, uh, and, and the crime of aggression. And um, it looks like that in terms of qualifying what, what is going on and holding the um, instigators of the war responsible, that gets the most traction at least in legal and political political mm -hmm. circles in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I can add just yeah. uh, ahead, one thing. Um, currently, there are uh, bodies uh, within uh, Europe 
collecting evidence of uh, Russian crimes. Of course, uh, the qualification of the crimes uh, will probably come at a later date, uh, mm -hmm. but the, the body of evidence is being collected. Um, so uh, when the war ends, uh, it will be used to, um, um, to put forward charges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question from Charles Haynes. How likely is it that the war will escalate into a limited question mark nuclear exchange? Uh, one speaker expressed a view that uh, Russia's economy is imploding, but we see many countries stepping up to buy, stepping up to buy Russian oil and gas. Please expand on the evidence for this implosion hypo hypothesis. So there's two separate questions here. And, and uh, uh, I know Tim, you were the one who raised the implosion. I think you were the one who raised the implosion hypothesis. And Serhi, you've you've written um, a number of books recently about nuclear issues. So maybe you want to speak to that. Uh, you know, I don't think I said anything about implosion of the economy. I don't think it's happening yet. Yeah. <clears throat> but it, they are experiencing severe economic stress, of course. Uh, and it's going to get worse. For sure, it's going to get worse. Uh, I think the Russian government acknowledges uh, such. As for escalation, well, what I'm thinking of there is really this uh, recent um, uh, bit of news about Russia placing tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Uh, this may be merely theater, of course, uh, and saber rattling, because Putin has done this repeatedly. But uh, I, I wouldn't be entirely confident that's all, uh, all that's involved. Um, if Russia were to consider escalating to the nuclear level, presumably with less damaging uh, tactical nuclear weapons, it's not clear what use these would be on the battlefield itself, since uh, the war is being fought in territory that Russia claims is part of Russia. Um, but also, its own troops would be at risk. Um, it's just not clear uh, what the benefit would be. Uh, so putting these weapons in Belarus puts them, of course, on the border with Poland. And so if, uh, again, Putin seems less and less risk averse as he gets older, this would obviously be an extremely risky and grave decision, but I don't think we can. Uh, I don't think we can fail to, to give some thought to the possibility that the use of a nuclear weapon would be against some kind of facility in Poland, which of course is a member of NATO. And uh, you know, if there's anything that's going to keep you awake at night, it's the thought of something like that. So I think we should all be learning what we can about this. It may be just theater, but uh, I'm not entirely sure. To be honest with you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And sorry, uh, uh, is my mistake is actually Sergei, I think, who said implosion. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I talked about implosion of Russia as a, a major sorry. power, military, political uh, power in the region. Um, in terms of the um, of, of the nuclear threat, um, uh, on, I'm I'm not much concerned about the uh, use of the nuclear weapons per se, partially because we are on familiar territory. Nothing really changed since the Cold War. Russia has no monopoly on the, on the nuclear weapons. And uh, so far, this balance of fear that really came into existence in 1949, it certainly saved us from the global war during the Cold War, and there are chances that it will be saving us in the future as well. I'm much more concerned with the new development that this war brought to the fore in, in, in the nuclear realm. And this is war coming to the nuclear sites the Russian takeover of Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Um, for a few days, the, the chances were that there would be another nuclear accident there. And uh, then taking over Europe's largest nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia with six uh, reactors going on there. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, difficult to predict what can happen there, not necessarily by design, but uh, none of the reactors, 400 reactors uh, there in the world today was designed or their protocols exist for what to do during the war. This is new development. And when I think about, about things nuclear, that what first comes to my mind, not, not the use of, of, of nuclear weapons per se. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Okay, the, the next question is, is has to do with whether Putin uh, will survive if the Russian war effort continues to struggle, but I think we um, uh, have covered that in slightly different form. So um, with apologies, I, I will uh, move on to the question after that, uh, which is from Yulia Bedenka. Uh, how likely is the scenario of frozen conflict in which the role of it says UK peacekeepers, but I will assume it means UN peacekeepers uh, could play in this um, in this scenario. Anybody want to speak about the possibility of UN peacekeepers playing a role? Well, Russia would be able to veto that if it uh, found this unacceptable. Uh, I haven't heard much discussion of this possibility, but I suppose it could be part of, of an armistice uh, scenario. Uh, there would be the issue of where these soldiers would come from, but I, that's probably soluble. I mean, I, I could imagine this part of a, uh, an armistice uh, arrangement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Unfortunately, we have exactly one more question in the queue. Um, and this one goes back to uh, Tanya's comments about uh, media in Ukraine and its role. People in Ukraine are more and more dependent on information through Telegram, as you said. The president and other Ukrainian political figures also reach uh, to people, reach out to people directly. Uh, people have to evaluate all the incoming information by themselves and should and should be susceptible or could be susceptible, I suppose, to disinformation or maneuvering. Can Ukrainians maintain a healthy democracy in this situation? Well, yes, this is the biggest uh, question uh, and uh, the biggest concern that uh, Ukrainian journalists and Ukrainians have right now, uh, just because we all know how what are the crucial role um, Ukrainian media played in the building democracy. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, probably the story of uh, Mustafa Nayem, who used to be uh, a Ukrainian independent journalist who once uh, wrote a post on social media, uh, on Facebook, and asked everybody to show up on the independent square in Ukraine, and then this is how the revolution started. So um, I should say that um, in independent Ukrainian media played enormous role, and we should say that, I should say that probably we still have this viewership and readership and trust uh, but if we are talking about the population of the whole country um yes te telegram channel or telegram as a social media become a big threat uh, should i say uh, because it's spreading does it does it disinformation really quickly and fast and there is no like filters uh, or anything. So journalists are kind of uh, uh, right now facing this challenge of basically verifying all the information that spread it all over a Telegram and social media and internet. And it was uh, incredibly hard in the beginning of the war. But now, uh, also when such a big territory of Ukraine impacted and um, when like big media mostly based in Kiev and there is no access to all um, all other cities or all cities in the same time. Um, there is this uh, clearly um, you know, big threat um, of uh, being manipulated by uh, Russian propaganda. Uh, but um, um, yeah, but Ukrainian journalists are doing their best. Uh, they're kind of a um, um, facing all these threats. And as I said, many media are closing, especially regional media, because they don't have any financing, that they, they kind of are shrinking. Uh, but um, um, so in, in long-term perspective, I think war will have this uh, enormous impact on independent uh, Ukrainian media and uh, on the democracy in general in Ukraine. Yes, of course, this is a um, um, big concern for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, we've come to the end of the forum. Thank you very much to our four distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you, of course, to the Weatherhead Center staff without whom uh, this would not have been possible. 
And thank you to everyone who joined us uh, remotely. We had, I think, at, at, our, at the height of the meeting, more than 140 um, uh, attendees who joined us and, uh, of course, those who contributed questions. Um, thanks to all of you. And I, I certainly, speaking for myself, learned a great deal from this conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye.